Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast in the Monarch Joint Venture National Conservation Training Center Monarch Conservation Webinar Series. My name is Tracy McLeaf. I'm a biologist and wildlife service at the National Conservation Training Center in West Virginia. I wanted to thank you for your interest in this series as we are now a few months into our third year. Continued participation and feedback is important to us. Now I'd like to introduce you to Monarch Joint Ventures Communication Specialist, Coralyn Preston. She'll tell you more about today's topic and presenters. Cora? Thank you, Tracy, and hi, everyone. Um, thank you again for joining us. We're really happy to have you all here. You um, really make this um, webinar series possible for us. Um, as Tracy mentioned, my name's Cora, and I'm also joined by Shelby from the Monarch Joint Venture in the chat box. Um, today, we're going to learn about monarchs and solar, a win-win in the land of milkweed and honey, from Rob Davis of Fresh Energy and Eric Udelhofen of One Energy Renewables. A little bit about our presenters. Rob Davis tells the stories of pioneering people, ideas, and organizations. As director of Media and Innovation Lab at Fresh Energy, Davis helps accelerate the nation's transition to use of clean and renewable energy. Previously, Davis helped launch technology startups and created the international crowdsource campaign that launched the Firefox web browser, which some of us are using. Davis is a two-time recipient of the Teresa Dubois X-Line Award for Best Practices in Communications and Marketing and graduate of McAllister College. Eric Udelhofen is the Director of Project Development at One Energy Renewables which is a developer of utility-scale solar energy projects across North America. Eric shepherds projects from inception through construction. Eric has worked in many areas of the solar industry, from financial analysis to sales and construction management to project development. Eric received his BA in Economics and Environmental Studies from Carleton College in Minnesota. Most weekends, you'll find him tending crops or working on restoration projects on the solar-powered homestead he runs with his wife and family in southwest Wisconsin. So a big thank you to our presenters today. If any questions come up during today's presentation, we encourage you to uh, include those in the chat box, and then we'll save your questions for the end and ask our presenters all the questions that we'll have time for at the end. So now I'll turn it over to Rob to get us started. Thank you so much. It's uh, such a pleasure to be with you all today. And thank you so much to Monarch Joint Venture for hosting this important conversation. Incredibly relevant just today as we're really at the, uh, at the precipice of, uh, of springtime throughout most of the United States. And also at a time when uh, there will be a tremendous uh, build out of, of solar energy uh, throughout the country. And uh, so I, I'd like to just um, kind of frame the conversation today to say that we, uh, I work with Fresh Energy, a 501c3 nonprofit based in St. Paul, a couple of blocks off the Mississippi River here in Minnesota. And we launched a, uh, a public education campaign a couple of, a couple of years ago calling for abundant quantities of bee and butterfly and bird food to be on and, on and around solar sites. Now, the way that we got here was, uh, was something wonderful, something absolutely transformative and fantastic. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Something we're all familiar with is mobile phones and the internet. And we're familiar with how those have changed our lives and how rapid that change has been. Well, solar is actually growing at quite a faster rate than mobile phones or the internet. And this is just the data from 1992 to 2012. Solar's actually grown even faster from 2012 to, to today. And the reasons are very clear. There was a lot of in direction early on with regards to energy policy. But more recently, it's all been about price. We're all familiar with how uh, cell phones and computers and a wide variety of things have gotten cheaper as more and more of them have been made. And that is definitely the case with solar. Absolutely plummeting prices. So I'd like to turn it over to Eric Udelhofen from One Energy Renewables and uh, to talk about 
a little bit more about solar and get into the nuts and bolts and get everybody on the same page about how a solar project comes together, what it looks like, and how the technology works. And then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about the opportunity for wildlife, the opportunity for agriculture, and uh, the opportunity for environmental uh, and soil health benefits. Eric? Great. Thanks, Rob. And um, really honored to be here. Uh, looked at the attendee list and, and just a great group of folks. I'm, I'm honored to be, uh, be speaking with you all. wish I could have, have met you all in person. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on our company. Um, I work for One Energy Renewables. Been around since about 2009, which is basically as long as the utility scale solar industry has, has been in existence. Um, we kind of are, are we're pioneers of this off-site solar project model where we build projects on behalf of customers that um, would like to, to go renewable but maybe don't have room on their rooftop. Um, that's how we started out, build projects for, com for uh, groups like the National Aquarium in Baltimore and several others and have expanded from there to be um, more of just a, a utility scale um, project developer. We are a, a B Corp and you know we I guess take a lot of pride in, in trying to be really good stewards of the land that we work on and the, the communities we work in. Um, and so I'm I'm very proud of being able to work for a company that's also a B Corp and um, and puts a lot of emphasis on those those parts of the business. Um, so this is just a, a really high level slide to make sure everyone's on the same page when, when we're talking about solar energy. Um, we are, are referring here to solar photovoltaic panels, which um, directly convert the sun's electricity, sorry, convert the sun into electricity. Um, this is not solar thermal or any of the power towers or you know, converting um, sunlight into, into thermal energy using a steam turbine. Um, this is just like the, the panels that you would see on a, any old rooftop, um, but instead of being on a, a rooftop, they're in a, an open field. Um, and, and we and take, oh, sorry, yeah, Rob, go for it. Eric, I was just going to chime in there to say I know that, you know, in, in some of the conservation communities, there's been a lot of confusion about that. Um, but yeah, ta power tower or concentrated solar generates heat. And uh, solar PV, which is totally different, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, it's just it only gets as hot as a car parked in the sun and uh, directly turns the sun into, into electricity. Go ahead. All right. So and that's we own, one energy only works on solar photovoltaic. And um, this is just a, a snapshot of the markets that we're active in. Um, I'm the director of the Midwest Project Development Team, so I'm based in Madison. I work in basically Madison and adjacent states and a, a few others kind of in the upper Midwest. Um, and then we have, have other folks who focus on the other regions. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about solar site selection and project development um, just to, so people could understand, um, you know, why we choose the sites we do and, and kind of see a little bit of what goes into that. So um, I'm just going to start with basically a, an example project. This is our farm in southwest Wisconsin. We're pretty close to Mount Horeb. So I just I figured I'd make a, a mock project here. I know a lot of these landowners, so that would be fun. You can see the little insignia there is taproot farm and fruit. Um, so in the middle of, this, of the picture here is uh, says Hooterville, that's a substation that is um, basically taking higher voltage power, stepping it down to a lower voltage, and then it's transmitted to the, um, the folks in the area to use, use power. And so that's going to be kind of our focal point. What we try to do, um, solar is ex extremely com competitive industry right now, and we're basically trying to compete with the cost of fossil fuels. In, um, especially in a market like Wisconsin where there's not a strong policy driver to do, to do renewables. 
Um, so we have to make sure that we're absolutely as cost effective as possible so we can duck underneath the cost of fossil fuels. And um, the best way to do that with most of these substations is to connect on the lower voltage side. And so in this case, just based on this substation, this isn't too important, but um, it's a 69 kV on the high side and it's about 13 kV on the low side, so we figure it can fit about 10 megawatts. So my wife gives me a hard time when I throw around megawatts and, and all these acronyms that are common in the solar industry, but to put it in context, it's, it's basically a megawatt takes about seven acres of land, and um, so when we're looking for 10 megawatts, that'd be about 75 to 80 acres, or, uh, you know, that's, what is that? Uh, a quarter, quarter section, two quarter, quarter sections. And um, that, just to, to give an idea of how much that would produce, we're figuring a fixed tilt system, so that's about enough for, um, 4,000 to 4,700 households that use about the same amount of power as, as our household does. Or if you want it in terms of, of panels, that's about 37,600 panels. So looking out from that substation, we've got to be as close to that as we can. Um, we don't want to have to build a long transmission line to access that substation. And so I just looked at a couple different parcels around here, looking at the, the plat map. And um, you can see in red, there's three different parcels here highlighted. They're 80 acres each, owned by the same individual or family. First thing I look at is, is a topographic screen. Um, just want to figure out what the lay of the land is. Um, in general, if there's a slope, it's a lot better if it's south facing, so you don't have to space the rows out too much. Um, otherwise, they'll shade one another more. And um, the more uniform it is going east to west, the better you are in terms of the layout. Again, just trying to, to find something as flat as possible helps. We're in a pretty hilly area of the state, so fairly difficult. Um, but you can see these are, are relatively south facing and, and seem like they have potential. So I'm going to keep going with all of them. This is another thing. I don't know if everyone uses Google Earth here, but I, I always look at the an elevation profile. Um, this going, e basically what, what it shows on the bottom is going east to west. So you can see that there's some undulations and, and a pretty significant rise in the middle. Um, so that's that's somewhat problematic depending on the layout, but again, it's, it's probably not a deal killer. And um, usually what I tell people is that if you can farm it, you can build solar on it usually. Um, we can build typically up to an 8% grade. If it's south facing, you can even go higher. Um, in our part of the state, people usually don't farm more than an 8% grade. So uh, that's kind of a rule of thumb. And the other things we'll look at are, are floodplains. We de generally try to avoid floodplains as much as possible in certain situations. Uh, you know, we, we and other developers have built in in floodplains, but you have to keep the electrical infrastructure above the flood elevation, and it's more expensive to get insurance and so forth. So we generally try to avoid those. Um, we're up on a ridge, so that's not an issue here, but you can see up in the top right corner there's there's a, a creek, so just to give you an idea. And then we'll look at, at wetlands. Um, uh, again, this is not an issue in this area, but um, we've got some, some drainages through the project to be cognizant of. Um, again, th these don't look like very sizable ones, but we'll, we'll try to avoid these, obviously, as much as we can. And then um, we're also very cognizant of, of permitting issues. We've had, we have had projects um, be, have to, you know, we've had to walk away from projects that were not able to be permitted. Um, in general, with solar, the biggest thing is just uh, the people that are right next to the facility are the ones that are, are going to um, experience the impacts because it's, it's very low from low profile. It's about the height of a mature corn plant. Um, so it's really the people that are right next to it that, that are going to see it. And um, so we're very aware of, of who the neighbors are, where they are. We try to work with them as much as we can. Um, but so I always try to map out where all the houses are. And then rank the sites. Um, this one on the far right is the best from my perspective. It's pretty flat. 
Uh, it generally faces south. It's a, it's a nice, clean rectangle, and it's not next to any houses. Um, so from there, I would approach the landowners, and we'd try to get, get some sort of lease agreement in place. Um, so that just brings me to the next point. I wanted to give people a, a sense for how a project gets developed and how long it typically takes. So in general, we, we say that it, it takes us six months all the way up to five years to get a project from idea to when we start construction. And um, typically that breaks down into four main buckets. The land agreement with the, the landowner, we've got to either have a, a lease agreement, an option to lease, or an option to purchase. Then we need to study what the, the impact is going to be on the electrical grid. So we've got to work with the utility. In this case, um, Alliant owns this substation. So we'd need to work with them to figure out, can they accept this amount of power? If so, what's it going to do to the grid in the area? Do we need to, to do any upgrades um, to make sure that, that it's not going to impact any of their customers? So depending on the utility, that varies wildly in how long it takes. Um, but I put three to 24 months as kind of a guideline. And then permits is kind of the next stage from there. And usually, in most counties, we're, we're seeking a conditional or a special use permit. Um, and then also ministerial permits, so building and electrical and so forth that are more of uh, right before the project gets built. But uh, in some cases, there are state permits, especially with larger projects. And often those are issued by the Public Service Commission. And then if you, um, I've done some work in the Tennessee Valley Authority area in, in Tennessee. And in that case, there's a federal nexus. So we have to go through the, the National Environmental Policy Act to permit projects. So depending on where you are and how big your project is, um, there are going to be a kind of a variety of permits that you've got to secure. Um, and then finally, once we've gotten the rest of these buckets checked and have an idea of what our project size is going to be, what areas we need to avoid, and so forth, we go into engineering. Um, and that's typically one to six months. And a lot of these overlap. So you know, I put them kind of in sequence just to give you a feel for it. But a lot of them are, you know, we're kind of running concurrently. All right. I think I'll pass it over to Rob now. Oh, no. Actually, sorry, I've got a couple other slides here. Um, OK, so I guess the next thing I was going to say, and, and maybe it makes more sense to talk more about this later, but I'll just give you a feel for, for pollinator habitat um, from a developer's perspective. So um, typically, the way we're looking at, at this, at establishing permitting, or sorry, establishing pollinator habitat, is that it's going to be more expensive on the front end to establish. Than, um, than a typical grass uh, grass mix. So we're we're usually budgeting about nine thousand sorry nine hundred to a thousand dollars per acre, which to put that in context of an overall project cost, it's about five thousand dollars per megawatt, which is less than a less than 05 percent of the total installation cost. Um, so it's it's not a huge upfront cost, but it is it is certainly more. Than, than just a regular grass seed mix. And there's going to be slightly more mowing in the early years. Um, and you know there's going to be some spot mowing to keep invasives down while the natives get established. Um, but in the long term, we're anticip I mean, these are 35-year projects uh, that, we, that we build the financial model for. And after the first three or four years, we are projecting that they're going to be significantly lower cost to maintain due to reduced mowing. Um, so that ends up being a big advantage in the long term. And, and I think we are pretty feel pretty confident about that and talk to other developers about that as well. And others that, that are in the market are, are kind of seeing similar benefits. So, um, And just for a little bit of best practices, um, and some of this stuff is from the Minnesota there, there have been some guidelines in Minnesota. But um, typically, they recommend seeding a fast-growing grain cover to stabilize the soil, so something like winter wheat or oats, and then mowing it before it goes to seed to, to basically nurse crop the, the uh, natives. I mean, you guys all probably know this a lot better than I do. 
but um, then we're kind of seeing a general rule of thumb of at least 40% forbs, and um, then some spot mowing at higher heights is going to be needed in initial years, uh, not to da net damage native plants, but to control invasives. And um, and then this is something that I've we don't have experience with, it, and this really hasn't been a concept for long enough, but. Long term, there may be a way to kind of rotate haying and mowing in later years, and then setting aside a certain amount of um, of the project area to not be mowed or, or receive very minimal mowing to serve as refugia. So these are some things that you know they're it's an evolving process. I think the industry is well served to share best practices around these, um, but you know this is something that we're cognizant of and trying to uh, trying to share as much knowledge as we can with others in the, in the industry. I just want to show this image quickly to show that there is a, a portion of the project area, probably about a third of the land area, to 30 to 40 percent of the land area that's going to be in shade. Um, so the, that's typically more of a turf grass mix, and then you know the area in front of the panel is obviously receiving more light. So just something to, to be aware of. And, and then Eric, the last thing. Eric, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Could you go back to that for a minute and just talk about the, the what what's happening to the soil here? Yeah, yeah. So I that's another benefit I did not mention, but obviously these roots are a lot deeper than uh, than just a typical turf grass mix, and you all know this well. But especially in the in this part of the country, and looking at the project areas we were on the earlier slides, there's some significant slopes, and so. Having these really deep root systems is helping with groundwater, or sorry, with uh, stormwater penetration and just stabilizing the soil. Um, so we think there are a lot of other benefits um, that come from these these deep roots. Did you have anything else you wanted to add, Rob? On that? That's really it. That's really it. Yeah, just that it's th these projects are building topsoil over time, and they're gonna the soil after the project is done is gonna be better better than it was when it started. Yeah, and I, I certainly, a big part of my job is negotiating lease agreements with landowners. And people, you know, mostly we're leasing, and people want to know, most of these folks are, uh, you know, maybe they're not going to be around to farm the land, but they want to see it ultimately converted back to farmland, or, you know, in a, they want to know what's going to happen to our equipment at the end of the project life. And I tell them, you know, we're required to take everything out to a certain depth, and and um, have the field back ready for you, um, but at that time we will have had a low, you know, a low-growing native seed mix for 35 plus years. This is going to be some some great soil, and um, you know, so for for some farmers that's a, a motivator. And then I just had one other. So this is my last slide. I just this is a picture I took last week at a project I. I was driving by, and this this is actually here in Wisconsin. It's not one of our projects, but it is going to have solar or pollinator habitat. Um, and I wanted people to to know that, and we're well aware of this, and kind of try to communicate it to our communities that we're in. That it is going to be a little bit, um, you know, it takes a while to get this established. It's not going to be a beautiful pollinator meadow in the first year. This has not been seeded yet. It's really just been constructed so it's it's a muddy mess and it was rainy but um, we you know we've got to persist through the first couple of years where it's going to require a lot of mowing and and uh, keep our eye on the, the long-term prize all right I'll pass it over to Rob now thanks so much Eric really really appreciate that and collaborating with you on this um, I just wanted to give a sense of scale and how we uh, fresh energy got into this, we're, we're ultimately an energy policy organization. Um, and we helped um, shape and drive some policy back in 2013 here in Minnesota that resulted in Minnesota scaling very, very quickly. So we went from about 15 megawatts of solar in 2013 to um, up to more than 250 megawatts of solar in 2020. Uh, 2016, and we'll do you know another 250 megawatts this year and and more the year after that. Now that creates a great deal of change, which requires a lot of adjustments. But thankfully, 
there's really smart engineers out there who have figured out this problem. This is a graph showing electricity use during the World Cup semifinal between England and Germany. And this is what happens to the electric grid when everybody gets up at the same time and goes to the refrigerator and opens it. So variability and uncertainty is something that engineers in the electric sector know how to manage. They have tools to manage. And they know how to manage all of this new uh, generation or variable generation that's coming onto the grid. So that, that problem is not completely solved, but the engineers have a pretty good handle on it. The problem, the, the situation that we're all kind of wrestling with right now is something Eric alluded to, is the folks that live immediately near these communities. Now, we both benefit and suffer from uh, you know, the desert southwest being some of the first large-scale solar development in the United States. And uh, so that means that there's thousands of pictures like this one out there in Getty Images and uh, in, in various Google Images archives. And after you see two or three or four of these, you begin to think, what did the solar panels do to the ground? So a solar developer might look at this and see something beautiful, but a farmer who's worked the land for a couple of generations is looking at the ground, is looking at the soil, and, uh, and begins to suspect that the solar is damaging the soil in some way. And that's also true when new projects come in because uh, unfortunately, some civil engineers are designing solar arrays that, uh, that are designed like substations. So they're, they're actually trucking in class five gravel and covering the ground three to five inches deep. Now, in a couple of years, after a couple of deluges, they're gonna probably have some gullies going on. Water likes to move, and water likes to bring things with it. Um, so, um, you know, that, that, that gravel won't stay put uh, so long uh, in, in, in that place. But it certainly doesn't convey the kind of agricultural values that, uh, that a farmer would, would be looking for. Uh, even right here in Minnesota where we're scaling up and, and folks are signing up for solar right and left, I mean, nonprofits and municipalities and corporations and also individuals and families. And the city of Mankato, a, a, a thriving city out out on the prairie, uh, signed up to go solar and it's gonna save $2 million over the next 25 years. And the story in the Mankato Free Press used this picture from Colorado. And you can see how people start to associate PV solar with either gravel or sand or something that's not useful in, uh, on, the, on the ground. Uh, that was re recently highlighted in the Wall Street Journal where you know, they highlighted the fact that you know, some people don't like to live next to these things. You know, siting is an issue. Now we know because throughout the United Kingdom and Germany, there is more than one gigawatt, i.e. more than 10,000 acres of solar that is built just like this, with a pollinator-friendly, low-growing meadow. And that's simply because the engineers got involved, and they said, you know what, this vegetation is just a, an engineering challenge. We're going to hand this over to some, some botanists and some ecologists, and they're going to design a seed mix and a vegetation management plan for the life of the project. So they're five or six years ahead of us on this. Uh, this uh, photo is from, uh, from, uh, from England. Now, we wanted to get that idea out there in Minnesota, so we worked with a bunch of solar companies. and took out a full page ad in the, the Star Tribune, the large paper here in town, and, uh, and came up with this newspaper ad saying, hey, local energy, local benefits, you know, going to, to, to more clean energy is gonna be really good. And then we realized, oh wait, you know, it's really good that folks are saying that it's gonna be beneficial to pollinators, but you know, we should probably, we should probably talk to the scientists. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't just, if you will, putting lipstick on a pig. And it, it happens, it's happened, that, um, that two of the world's foremost experts on uh, pollinator issues, uh, MacArthur Genius Award winner, Dr. Marla Spivak, whose TED Talk has more than two and a half million views. She is a, a bee scientist, and she's right here in town. And Dr. Karen Oberhauser, she is the 
Kevin Garnett of Monarch, <laughs> and they're both just absolutely amazing and exemplary titans in their field. And so when we went to them and said, hey, Minnesota's going to get a couple of thousand acres of solar over the next few years, you know, we have 27 million acres of farmland here. Is that even interesting? Is that helpful? And they said emphatically, yes. And not only have they said it, but several other of the top pollinators and, and, and bee scientists and pollinator scientists throughout the country have enthusiastically agreed and, uh, and collaborated with us on, in this work. Now, the situation for pollinators is dire. I'm sure everyone, most of the folks on this call are very aware of that. Since 1950s, we've lost, I think, more than 50% of our honeybees. Um, so that's driving prices up, certainly, for commercial beekeepers. It's also, there's also a crisis in the wild, uh, wild pollinators space, and, and uh, uh, the population of monarchs is in steep decline. Pollinators provide a very critical resource, not just in giving us a sense of peace and, and beauty and tranquility that we love with our families when we go hiking or camping or just in our backyards or in our parks, but also in the food we eat. You know, these, these, these necessary insects, these important insects, are moving pollen between flowers and helping us have abundant crops. The White House actually did a full study of this a couple of years ago uh, in 2015 and, and said that um, every year the uh, honeybee alone adds more than $15 billion, $15 billion of value to our food system. And here's what that looks like. In the upper left-hand corner, you see a well-pollinated strawberry. In the upper right-hand corner, you see a well-pollinated raspberry. Lower left is a poorly pollinated apple. I mean, these, these, are, these are examples of poor and incomplete pollination. So there's a lot of money at stake here. I mean, even for a crop like soybeans, which everybody, I think, associates with wind pollination, uh, the, the, the uh, Department of Agriculture in Maryland cites studies that show an increase of 18% for the yields from soybeans that are adjacent to pollinator habitat. But unfortunately in solar, the standard practice is this. We're putting in all this capital and then designing a system that is going to have a mower be filled up with gas and leak oil every couple of weeks for 25 to 35 years. And uh, just to share a story, these, these, the guys who, who would drive these tractors, they have a really hard problem um, because they, they can't turn that thing around. So it might be a quarter mile long. It might be a very long stretch. Um, and uh, they're going back and forth and back and forth. And, uh, you know, one, one of the guys was, was telling me that a solar company was giving him a hard time because, you know, he hit one of the panels. He hit one of these posts. And he said, well, yeah, sure, but I missed 20,000. But unfortunately, even a small hit is very, very expensive. So any strategies that can decrease the frequency that mowers are brought onto sites isn't just reducing the cost of mowing, it's reducing the risk of collisions. Getting the pollination, I think this, this crowd is probably very savvy with this. This is what you and I see. This is what a bee sees when it comes to nectar and pollen. And then when we're designing a suburban landscape, this is what you and I see when we see the suburban landscape, and this is what a bee sees. So there's nothing there to eat. Mm -hmm. So if we design solar in ways that, that, that have those kind of suburban qualities, of course farmers are going to think that it's not an appropriate use of farmland. Now in the conservation space, pollinator habitat is critical. It's not just about the bees, it's not just about the, the butterflies, it's about the larva, it's about all of the insects, because they're visiting native plants. I mean, for example, there, and, the, and, and, and this is, the numbers are quite staggering here, uh, a single clutch of four to six chicks, like uh, Carolina chickadee chicks, will eat more than 9,000 caterpillars in the 16 days between when they hatch and when they leave the nest. 
the math on that is staggering in terms of thinking how busy those birds must be. But um, 9,000 caterpillars in 16 days for four to six chicks. So abundance of, uh, of healthy food for birds is critical, um, particularly as habitat and climate change uh, have serious pressures on, uh, on these species. When it comes to designing uh, a solar array with, uh, with pollinator-friendly vegetation and low-growing meadow, you just have to think like an engineer. People get, you throw up their hands and say, well, how are we going to do that? And the answer is service level contracts. You're going to specify, I want a solar site that has vegetation that meets these characteristics. It has to be low growing. It has to be resilient to droughts, intense downpours. Maybe it'll have the benefit of providing some insulation to reduce the amount of frost heave. And it has to provide some benefit to agriculture and to conservation. So when you design that, the, you know, you come up with that specification, you hand it to a vegetation company, an ecological services company, a landscape company, then they can give you a competitive bid and sign a contract. It's, uh, this comic, I think, does a great job of like just showing what a great solution this is. There's, there's this good thing, peanut butter, which is a pollinator habitat, and there's this fantastic thing, chocolate, which is the solar. And uh, they are both delicious, but they're better together. Here's what it looks beforehand. Here's what it looks like afterwards. Mm -hmm. Usually these sites are drill seeded down the middle and then broadcast seeded underneath their rows. That ends up creating jobs, a different kind of management. It means native seed companies are growing more abundant quantities of native seed out in rural America, where solar companies need more representation and they need stronger voices. They need those rural legislators to hear that there's more jobs in their communities because of these sites. That's part of the way to get improved conservation outcomes. Now, I have a couple of project highlights here because there's just, there's just so much great success happening. Now, this is Connexus Energy, they're the largest co-op in the state of Minnesota. And this project was going to be done with gravel. The uh, marketing person saw the plans and, you know, kind of raised her voice and, and said, you know, could we do this a little differently? Could we, could we just put in, some, could we put, put in some flowers and make it look nice? And uh, that was back in 2014. I spent some time on the site um, in uh, last summer. This is a site that was installed uh, by a local company, Prairie Restorations. The site's been managed throughout the time, and uh, it's absolutely stunning. It's the CEO's favorite project. They highlighted the whole project, the Community Solar Garden, to their customers in their newsletter about how they are actually you know, significantly helping, not just in, you know, under power lines and under distribution lines, but also on and around their solar array. By, by, doing, by pursuing this approach, there's an abundant number of positive media stories that can happen. So um, local solar project turns land into pollinator haven. What a tremendous success for that, for uh, an L Green Power. Uh, Minnesota Power and Camp Ripley on the northern part of the state. This is a 62-acre site, 10 megawatts. Uh, not too far from the Mississippi River. You see that there in the foreground. So this is an important bird flyway. The whole project is going to be pollinator friendly. Aurora Solar Project, a 16, uh, 1,000 acre total project distributed over 16 sites throughout the state. They use a pollinator friendly seed mix throughout the array and around the project. And I'll, I, I highlight the, the forbs that are, you know, specific here. You can see right down here some of the, you know, prairie onion and um, prairie blue-eyed grass. And uh, there's, there's just a tremendous amount of diversity in these seed mixes. In this one here, designed by Community Energy, they have three different kinds of milkweed that will be used on the project. 
Now this one in particular, this, this is a huge, right at the end of a huge transmission line that goes up to Manitoba, comes down uh, with Manitoba hydropower and has a substation right in central Minnesota, bright red county. And uh, I went to the public hearing for this project. You know, about 80 people jammed into a room built for 60 people. And uh, you, uh, you know, there's about 110 degrees. The first six people to testify about this project said, I'm not really here for the solar. I'm here for the bees. Mm -hmm. We need this project for the bees. And for folks that are really interested in deploying more pollinator habitat at scale, that's a really tremendous opportunity to get involved, to show up and say, we need this project, and the solar's fine. Maybe that's not your thing. But if your thing is pollinators, if your thing is monarchs, if your thing is birds, these projects can be built in ways that significantly help conservation. Throughout Wisconsin, wow, what a tremendous success in Wisconsin. So many rural electric co-ops have done projects that are pollinator friendly. Richland Electric Co-op, St. Croix Electric Co-op, Jump River Electric Co-op, Oakdale Electric, Dunn Energy, Taylor Electric, Vernon Electric, Eau Claire Energy, Scenic Rivers Energy, Riverland Energy, all of those projects are going to look like some of these other pictures. Here's the CEO of Dairyland uh, who distributes power to all of those co-ops, talking to a group of three or 400 people. And she's very proud of the, uh, the work that's been done. And I can understand. Co-locating, the idea of co-locating Solar and agriculture is being studied by the Department of Energy. There's a tremendous amount of, of uh, benefits that can be here. Um, but for, for, for folks that are interested in conservation, you know, this is, I think, really interesting um, because solar and sheep can be co-located. We can do that. Solar and uh, grazing cattle can be done. We can do that. Uh, in fact, co-location of you know, hand-harvested hand crops like, uh, you know, can be done. We have plenty of sheep. We have plenty of cattle. We have plenty of kale. We seem to have a bee problem, though. We seem to have a monarch problem, though. There's a tremendous opportunity for these sites to actually provide the benefits that are, that are, that are needed the most. And I think that the easiest solution for solar developers to provide is not, is not the, the, the vegetables and, the, and, the, and crops, not the cattle, it's not the sheep, but it's actually the low-growing, pollinator-friendly meadows. And so this isn't just, a, a, I think, a, a series of benefits that, that's great and helpful for, for conservationists to understand, but also when you're working and talking to farmers, where this is usually, you know, throughout the eastern United States and maybe central United States, most of these lands are going to be previously have been farmed, it's important to talk about how that soil will contribute productively to agriculture. So uh, Nature Conservancy did a study in New Jersey in 2013 and showed that for 10 major crops, tomatoes, blueberries, melons, cucumbers, squash, apples, peaches, gross revenues increase from the installation of pollinator habitat. Those, those, are, those are, I think, probably Magic words to any farmer's ears. <laughs> Gross revenues increase. So in 2016, Minnesota, we realized, you know, I mean, I'm a marketing person myself, I'm a communications person, and I know the temptation to go out, buy $100 worth of, I don't know, milkweed, plant it, mature, get the camera right down close, get that just the right angle, and then call the whole 100-acre project pollinator friendly. Unfortunately, that approach is just going to burn bridges with conservationists, with farmers. It's going to lead to significant distrust. So we need to make sure that we're relying on the scientists to tell us what pollinator friendly is, uh, within reason. You know. So we passed a law in Minnesota. It's very simple. It's very simple. It's the, the key language is right here down below. We worked with uh, agricultural leaders, uh, State Representative Rod Graham and State Senator Dan Sparks. 
the, the law is very simple. It says you can't call it pollinator friendly unless you meet the standard. So what's the standard? Well, uh, the standard was, uh, was designed, by, designed by, by this group of scientists I mentioned earlier, Marla Spivak and Karen Oberhauser and Xerxes and others. And then we worked with Audubon and Minnesota Corn Growers Association and Minnesota Farmers Union on the bill to pass it. Unanimous support, 126 to 0 in the uh, Republican-controlled Minnesota House. The bill, uh, the standard itself is a very simple, straightforward scorecard. And the folks at Xerxes and, and uh, Karen and Marla and, and others, uh, Taylor Ricketts at the UVM uh, Gund Institute in Vermont, uh, have worked with us and supported us in, in developing a scorecard. The scorecard is very simple. It provides flexibility and integrity so that a solar developer doesn't have to rely on their marketing intern to say what's good for pollinators. They can instead eliminate that risk. They can take that risk away, and they can simply say, hey, look, the scientists say that if we get 70, out of 70 points out of 130 or more that are possible, then it's pollinator friendly. It's beneficial pollinators. If we get 85 or more, then it's exemplary pollinator habitat. The scientists recognize that these are managed landscapes, usually converting farmland into uh, excuse me, taking farmland from a, 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 a corn or soybeans and using it with solar and, uh, and native vegetation. So it's a significant improvement for pollinators over the previous condition. Well, again, acknowledging that it's a managed landscape. Um, there's more information about this in the uh, NREL webinar uh, that was hosted um, in January. There's some information about that on Fresh Energy's website, if you just do a, do a search on Fresh Energy's website for uh, agriculture or co-location of agriculture and solar. And this is, I think, the key number for folks on this, on this call is that Minnesota in 2016 alone, as a result of having this standard in place, built and seeded pollinator-friendly projects equivalent to every single family home in the state getting a six foot by 12 foot pollinator garden. And as Eric mentioned, these, these projects last 25 to 35 years. I don't know of anyone in my family or anyone else's family who's kept their garden up, particularly their pollinator garden up for that period of time. I think all the rest I have is just some beautiful slides showing some examples of these projects. Here's that Connexus Energy project. It's going to look even more beautiful this year. We really appreciate your time. We welcome, uh, we welcome your comments and questions. Thank you, Rob and Eric, so much for presenting with us today. Um, and also a huge thank you to everyone who's listening. We're really glad you're all here. Um, we're going to take the next few minutes to ask Rob and Eric some questions that came up during the presentation. Um, and also just a note, we did record today's webinar, so if you want to watch it again or share it with friends or colleagues, um, it will be available online on the Monarch Joint Venture and NCTC websites when it is ready. Um, one more note, we will follow up with an email today with additional resources um, and a short survey for you as participants to complete sharing any feedback that you have. We would really love to hear from you about your ideas for future webinars, your feedback on this one or other webinars in this series. Um, you're helping us um, continue to improve and make this a great webinar series. Um, so we may not get to all of the questions that we were asked throughout the webinar, but we'll get to as many as we have time for today. And let me see here. One that um, I'm going to answer quick just to get us started. Um, there was a question about um, management on solar sites and if, if there is mowing, like Eric mentioned, um, what time of year would that take place and how does that affect caterpillars? Um, so the Monarch Joint Venture has put out a um, handout of um, best practices for mowing um, with the least harm to monarchs. 
And so that handout is available as a recommendation for the timing of management anywhere that there is monarch habitat. Um, and so we, uh, that is regionally based, so the timing would vary from um, site to site and region to region, um, but we would recommend that folks follow that um, management guideline that's on our resources page on the Monarch Joint Venture. Um, Eric or Rob, do you have anything to add to the mowing question of um, management on the sites and how that might affect pollinators? I would just say that, you know, these are, these, um, everyone acknowledges that these sites are first and foremost energy generation facilities. So, um, you know, I would certainly say work with your vegetation management company to design the right mowing schedule. Um, they can they can be provided with this scorecard, and um, and uh, you know in order to to maximize the value to pollinators while also um, minimizing the cost. Great. Um, we had a a question for Eric that is related. Um, how would having pollinator habitat on a site achieve um, cost savings in the long term? Does the native vegetation need less mowing, for example, or what are some of those factors? Yeah, that, that's the main um, benefit is, is basically less mowing over the, starting in, say, year three or four, um, we're projecting that this type of habitat would not need to be mowed as regularly as, as a typical mix. Um, a typical grass mix. So that, that's the main operational savings. Um, I would also say that a large part of the benefit from this is at the front end of during the project development stage. Um, you know, being able to communicate about these projects as having other benefits than just being a sterile um, energy generation facility is really helpful, both when we're talking to the communities and permitting agencies where we're working, but also to, to the customers for power, you know, whether it's a, a corporate uh, a corporate customer or a municipality or a, an electric company utilities. Uh, people want to be part of a story like this. Um, so that that's also, I would say, maybe even a, a greater benefit than the long-term operational um, cost savings. Great. Um. Another question that we had was about if there is a standard seed mix for pollinators by pollinators by region. And I will mention um, that the Xerxes Society has put together um, monarch pollinator, um, monarch specific nectar plant list that are by region. So those are a great resource um, for folks if they're thinking about what plants to include. Um, as far as specifically for solar, um, this is a two-part question here. One part is for Rob, and one is going to be for Tracy. Um, Rob, is there somewhere people can go to find an example seed mix online for low-growing plants that are suitable for solar? Yeah, actually, all of the seed mixes that I showed in this webinar, um, those are from public utilities filings. and. Uh, here in in Minnesota for for these large projects, so those are already in the on the public utilities website, but they'll also be available from Fresh Energy's website. Um, that that said, um, I think the best solution is to work with your vegetation management company. Um, mm -hmm. Don't expect your civil engineer, uh, who has a background in designing glass and steel and doing this kind of stuff, to pick out your your seed mix. Um, you know. Work with, a, work with a professional who can look at the site and make a, a seed mix recommendation based on the site. Uh, because a different kind of soil is, uh, is going to result in a different kind of performance. Um, and uh, you want to make sure that you have plants for that site, your site, that uh, meet your, your, your specific criteria, whether it's 18-inch uh, or 24-inch or 36-inch condition. Uh, work with your vegetation management company to, to design uh, uh, that uh, uh, come up with the right plan for your project. Great. Thanks, Rob. Um, and I know that we have quite a few people from the Fish and Wildlife Service on the webinar. So, Tracy, do you know if there's um, uh, recommended seed mixes that the Fish and Wildlife Service or other federal agencies prefer? 
not right offhand. Um, several several refuges I know have mixes that they've been working on. Ones I recommend to people who are doing smaller scale projects are, like Cora mentioned, I refer them to either Xerxes or Pollinator Partnership has uh, regional plant lists as well that are that are pollinator specific, not necessarily just monarch specific, with um, different bloom times and and different layers like the the forbs and the shrubs and the trees and things, which shrubs and trees wouldn't necessarily apply to this. But so the short answer is check with your local refuge if they've got large projects going on. At NCTC, we do some of our own stuff here, depending on, of course, where you are. But for most resources, we're still referring people from NCTC to Xerxes or to um, Pollinator Partnership plan list. And Great. I might just interject real quick. This is Eric. Um, a lot of times projects do install like a vegetative buffer. Maybe not a lot of times, but it's not uncommon for there to be a vegetative buffer outside of the fence that's some kind of a shrub um, or bush or, or evergreen and that sort of thing. And um, I would be, this is just something that just occurred to me, but I'd be interested in, in trying to maybe incorporate that into this overall framework. If, you know, in the event that we do have to do those in, in certain cases, try to make, make sure that it contributes to the overall pollinator-friendly habitat. Right, and we found that a lot of the trees and shrubs are important sources in the spring in this area before your before a lot of your forbs might be in full production for the early pollinators. Great. Um, thank you all. Another question for Eric. Um, do you always plant on recently farmed fields? And um, how do you prepare a recently farmed field um, for being a solar site with pollinator habitat? Yeah, um, I, we definitely don't always plant on recently farmed fields, but it's the majority of, of the time it is something that was has been in cultivation. Um, in some cases, you know, we've we've looked at um, pasture land that that is in um, hay fields, and in, in some cases, we wouldn't necessarily even have to have to do anything to that soil. We would just um, just go ahead and install into it if there's already an established um, pasture, and then maybe augment, you know, seed over, seed into that. It just depends on the the situation. But as far as site prep goes, um, usually we just work with the farmer uh, to, you know, we know we're gonna, when we're going to be building far enough in advance to work with the farmer to make sure that they har harvest their crops and then we're building into it, um, you know, the, the next season. So, I, you know, in a lot of scenarios, you're planting into a corn and soybean field that's, that's pretty weed-free. And so, you know, that's how a lot of people manage or try to get prairies established um, anyways is on the fields like that. So it works pretty well. Um, for that type of setup, but you know, as far as site prep, we try to disturb the soil as little as we as we have to. Um, in some cases, we have to move a little bit of dirt here and there uh, to to level things off. But but our preference is to do that as little as we have to. Great, um, Rob. This question came up a couple times, um, and there's people were wondering if there have been any studies on the effects on birds of um, solar sites. Are you aware of any of those? There's been, um, there's, they've completed a study in the UK um, on comparing some control sites to uh, solar sites with pollinator habitat and found a, a significant increase in the abundance of, of pollinators, but not necessarily in the diversity. Um, but I'm not aware of, uh, you know, of studies that have been done on the bird populations uh, coming out of the UK. They're, you know, they're, they're five years ahead, so I would expect them to be um, study on that. The other study I'm aware of related to these sites is that the um, operating temperatures of the sites are about five degrees Celsius cooler than the surrounding area. So the, the, thick, the thick vegetation helps significantly reduce uh, surface temperatures. Which is really interesting, but but um, in yeah, the surface temperature related to pollinators, yes, studies, uh, but I haven't seen studies related to increased populations of of birds and the specific benefits uh, to birds yet. Okay. A, a great a, a great opportunity for a research proposal, definitely. <laughs> yeah, and 
one other quick thing on that. I mean, there are a lot of solar projects happening near airports, and that feedback I've gotten from a project near an airport was, you know, is this going to is this going to draw in birds? Um, you know, which is not necessarily something they want. So, if anyone does turn up any data on that, I'd be really interested to to know. Yeah. Good. Um, well, we have hit um, 2 o'clock Central Time, 3 o'clock Eastern, so um, we're going to wrap up our Q&A. Um, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of our questions today, um, but thank you all so much for being here. A huge thank you to Rob and Eric for sharing your expertise with us and to NCTC for hosting our webinar. Um, and thanks again to all of, all of the participants for being here today. Um, Take our follow-up survey and let us know how we're doing. Um, and um, look forward to an email with more resources in that survey soon. We hope to see you as well for our next webinar, which will be Tracing the Cultural Significance of Monarchs on May 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, so go to the Monarch Joint Venture events page on our website um, to find more information about that webinar. Um, a huge thank you to everyone here today, and um, we'll see you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.